The Tlatelolco massacre was the killing of an estimated 30 to 300 students and civilians by military and police on October 2, 1968, in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas in the Tlatelolco section of Mexico City. The events are considered part of the Mexican Dirty War, when the government used its forces to suppress political opposition. The massacre occurred 10 days before the opening of the 1968 Summer Olympics in Mexico City. More than 1,300 people were arrested by security police. There has been no consensus on how many were killed that day in the plaza area. At the time the government and the mainstream media in Mexico claimed that government forces had been provoked by protesters shooting at them. But government documents made public since 2000 suggest that the snipers had been employed by the government. Estimates of the death toll ranged from 30 to 300, with eyewitnesses reporting hundreds dead. According to U.S. National Security Archives, Kate Doyle, a senior analyst of U.S. policy in Latin America, documented the deaths of 44 people. The head of the Federal Directorate of Security reported the arrests of 1,345 people on October 2. Background the year 1968 in Mexico City was a time of expansiveness and the breaking down of barriers, a time for forging alliances among students, workers, and the marginal urban poor and challenging the political regime. It was a time of great hope, seemingly on the verge of transformation. Students were out in the streets, in the plazas, on the buses, forming brigades going to the people, there were movement committees at each school and heady experiences of argument, exploration, and democratic practice. There was no central leader. Families were drawn in whole apartment buildings and neighborhoods. A revolution was happening, not Ches revolution, but a revolution from within the system, non-violent, driven by euphoria, conviction, and the excitement of experimentation on the ground. Descent magazine The Mexican government invested a massive $150 million in preparation for the 1968 Olympics to be hosted in Mexico City. That amount was equal to roughly $1 billion by today's terms. Mexican President Gustavo Díaz Ordaz struggled to maintain peace during a time of rising social tensions but suppressed movements by labor unions and farmers fighting to improve their lot. He wanted to present the country in a positive light without protests. His administration suppressed independent labor unions, farmers, and was heavy-handed in trying to direct the economy. In 1958 under the previous administration of Adolfo López Mateos, labor leader Demetrio Vallejo had tried to organize independent railroad unions, which the Mexican government quickly ended. It arrested Vallejo under a violation of Article 145 of the Penal Code, which defined social dissolution as a crime, arising from reaction to the government's violent repression of fights between rival Porras. The student movement in Mexico City quickly grew to include large segments of the student body who were dissatisfied with the regime of the PRI. Sergio Zameno has argued that the students were united by a desire for democracy, but their understanding of what democracy meant varied widely. National Strike Council officially formed after the Mexican government's violation of university autonomy during the summer of 1968. The National Strike Council organized all subsequent protests against the Diaz Ordaz government. The CNH was a democratic delegation of students from 70 universities and preparatory schools in Mexico. It coordinated protests to promote social, educational, and political reforms. At its apex, the CNH had 240 student delegates and made all decisions by majority vote, had equal representation by female students, and reduced animosity among rival institutions. Raul Alvarez Garin, Socrates Campos Limas, Marcelino Perello, and Gilberto Guevara Nibla served as the four de facto leaders of the CNH. The CNH demanded repeal of Articles 145 and 145b of the Penal Code. 
the abolition of Granaderos, freedom for political prisoners, the dismissal of the chief of police and his deputy, the identification of officials responsible for the bloodshed from previous government repressions, assault on vocational school number 5 on July 23, 1968. The police entered with force into vocational school number 5. They claimed it was to capture members of street gangs who had enrolled in the school. The Granaderos were used by the Mexican government to control and suppress the student demonstrators and they were first used against the students in July 1968. However, the riot police assaulted numerous students and teachers in the process of clearing vocational school number no. 5. In an informal interview with some Granaderos, Antonio Correga recounted that, the Granaderos said that the authorities gave the men in the riot squad 30 pesos for every student they clubbed and hauled off to jail. The student movement began to coalesce after the government's assault on vocational school number no. 5, which marked the first major infringement on student autonomy. Students formed brigadas, groups of six or more students who distributed leaflets about the issues in the streets, markets, and most often on public buses. These parochial organizations, the smallest units of the CNH, decided the scope and issues which the student movement would take up. These included both rural and urban concerns. The brigadistas would board buses to speak to the passengers about the government's corruption and repression, while others distributed leaflets and collected donations. Eventually, the passengers and bus drivers began to sympathize with the students' demands for democracy and justice, and the students collected increasing amounts of money. But the aggressive militancy among the students began to disillusion some bus drivers about the students' motives and they suspected the youths of seeking power for its own sake. Protest at UNAM on August 1. National Autonomous University of Mexico Rector Barros Sierra led 50,000 students in a peaceful protest against the repressive actions of the government and violation of university autonomy. The orderliness of the demonstration proved to the Mexican public that the students were not rabble-rousers. Additionally, the demonstration showed it unlikely that communist agitators could have coordinated the students' actions. The protest route was planned specifically to avoid the Zosolo. The current UNAM website stated that the march route began from University City, ran along Insurgentes Avenue to Felix Quavers, turned on Felix Quavers towards Keoacan Avenue and returned by University Avenue back to the starting point. The march proceeded without any major disturbances or arrests. On September 9, Barros Sierra issued a statement to the students and teachers to return to classes. Our institutional demands have been essentially satisfied by the recent annual message by the citizen president of the republic. The CNH issued a paid announcement in the newspaper. El Dia, for the silent march on September 13, it invited all workers, farmers, teachers, students, and the general public to participate in the march. The CNH emphasized that it had no connection with the 20th Olympic Games or with the national holidays commemorating Mexico's independence, and that this committee has no intention of interfering with them in any way. The announcement reiterated the list of six demands from the CNH, with the opening of the Olympics approaching. Diaz Ordaz was determined to stop these demonstrations. In September, he ordered the army to occupy the UNAM campus. They took the campus without firing a bullet, but beat and arrested students indiscriminately. Barros Sierra resigned in protest on September 23. Occupation of IPN students began to prepare for defensive operations in other institutions. They put on a much stronger resistance when the police and the army tried to occupy the polytechnic campuses of Zacatenco and Santo Tomas. The battle lasted from 1700 hours on September 23 to the early hours of September 24. The physician Justo Igor de Leon Loyola wrote in his book, La Noche de Santo Tomas, Today I have seen bloodier fights, 
unequal battles. Both sides are armed. But what a difference in the weapons, handguns calibre 22 against military rifles M1, bazookas against Molotov bombs. The Polytechnic students held their campuses against the army for more than 12 hours, which aroused strong opposition by the government. The French journal Le Express stated that 15 people died in the battles and that more than 1,000 bullets were fired. The government reported three dead and 45 injured people. Students from the Santo Tomas campus who were arrested in the occupations later said that they had been concentrated for defense in the entry lobbies. The military shot at them randomly and some of their friends did not survive. Massacre On 2 October 1968, around 10,000 university and high school students gathered in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas to protest the government's actions and listen peacefully to speeches. Many men and women not associated with the CNH gathered in the plaza to watch and listen. They included neighbors from the residential complex bystanders and children. The students had congregated outside the Chihuahua building, a three-module 13-story apartment complex in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas. Among their chants were No Querimos Olympiadis, Querimos Revolution. Rally organizers did not try to call off the protest when they noticed an increased military presence in the area. Two helicopters, one from the police, and another one from the army, flew over the plaza. Around 5.55 p.m., red flares were shot from the nearby SRE tower. Around 6.15 p.m., another two flares were shot, this time from a helicopter as 5,000 soldiers, 200 tankets and trucks surrounded the plaza. Much of what proceeded after the first shots were fired in the plaza remained ill-defined for decades after 1968. Records and information released by American and Mexican government sources since 2000 have enabled researchers to study the events and draw new conclusions. The question of who fired first remained unresolved years after the massacre. The Mexican government said gunfire from the surrounding apartments prompted the army's attack, but the students said that the helicopters appeared to signal the army to fire into the crowd. Journalist Elena Poniatowska culled interviews from those present and described events in her book Massacre in Mexico. Flares suddenly appeared in the sky overhead and everyone automatically looked up. The first shots were heard then. The crowd panicked and started running in all directions. Despite CNH efforts to restore order, the crowd on the plaza quickly fell into chaos. It is presumed that President Diaz Ordaz was the first to shoot. Shortly thereafter, the Olympia Battalion, a secret government branch made for the security of the Olympic Games composed of soldiers, police officers, and federal security agents, were ordered to arrest the leaders of the CNH and advanced into the plaza. The Olympia Battalion members wore white gloves or white handkerchiefs tied to their left hands to distinguish themselves from the civilians and prevent the soldiers from shooting them. Captain Ernesto Morales Soto stated that, immediately upon sighting a flare in the sky, the prearranged signal, we were to seal off the aforementioned two entrances and prevent anyone from entering or leaving. The ensuing assault into the plaza left dozens dead and many more wounded in its aftermath. The soldiers responded by firing into the nearby buildings and onto the crowd, hitting not only the protesters but also watchers and bystanders, demonstrators and passers-by alike, including youngsters, journalists, and children, were hit by bullets. A mounds of bodies soon lay on the ground. Meanwhile, on the Chihuahua building, where the speakers stood, Olympia Battalion members pushed people and ordered them to lie on the ground near the elevator walls. 
People claim these men were the people who shot first at the soldiers and the crowd. Video evidence also points out that at least two companies of the Olympia Battalion hid themselves in the nearby apartment buildings, including setting up a machine gun in an apartment on the Molino del Rey building, where a sister-in-law of then-Secretary of State Luis Echeverria lived, the Church of Santiago de Tlatelolco, where snipers were positioned into the roof, the nearby convent and the Foreign Relations Tower where there were many people involved including but not limited to the ones who fired the first two flares, a machine gun on the 19th floor, and a video camera on the 17th floor. Interestingly enough, video evidence shows ten white-gloved men leaving the church and bumping into soldiers, who point their weapons at them. One of the men shows what appears to be an ID, and they are let go. The killing continued throughout the night, with soldiers and policemen operating on a house-to-house -house basis in the apartment buildings adjacent to the square. The Chihuahua building as well as the rest of the neighborhood had its electricity and phones cut off. Witnesses to the event claim that the bodies were first removed in ambulances and later military officials came and piled up bodies, not knowing if they were dead or alive, into the military trucks. While some say that the bodies were piled up on garbage trucks and sent to unknown destinations, the soldiers rounded up the students onto the Chihuahua building's elevator walls, stripped them, and beat them up. 3,000 attendees were taken to the convent next to the church and were left there until early in the morning, most of these being people that had little to nothing in common with the students and were only neighbors, bystanders, passersby and others who were on the plaza just to listen to the speech. Other witnesses claim that in the later days, Olympia Battalion members would disguise themselves as light and water employees and inspect the houses in search of students. The official government explanation of the incident was that armed provocateurs among the demonstrators, stationed in buildings overlooking the crowd, had begun the firefight. Suddenly finding themselves sniper targets, the security forces had simply returned the shooting in self-defense. By the next morning, newspapers reported that 20 to 28 people had been killed, hundreds wounded, and hundreds more arrested. Most of the Mexican media reported that the students provoked the army's murderous response with sniper fire from the apartment buildings surrounding the plaza. El Día's morning headline on October 3, 1968 read as followed, Criminal provocation at the Tlatelolco meeting causes terrible bloodshed, the government-controlled media dutifully reported the Mexican government side of the events that night. But the truth eventually emerged. A 2001 investigation revealed documents showing that the snipers were members of the Presidential Guard who were instructed to fire on the military forces in order to provoke them. Investigation and response In 1998, President Ernesto Zedillo, on the 30th anniversary of the Tlatelolco massacre, authorized a congressional investigation into the events of October 2. However, the pre-government continued its recalcitrance and did not release official government documents pertaining to the incident. In a 2002 All Things Considered radio interview with Kate Doyle, director of the Mexican Documentation Project for the U.S. National Security Archive, she described the pre-government's investigations. I mean, there have been a number of investigations throughout the years. In fact, former President Miguel de la Madrid was interviewed yesterday in the press and said that he had asked the military and the interior secretary for documents and for photographs of the demonstrations, and was subjected to tremendous political pressure not to investigate. And when he continued to press, the military and the interior ministry claimed that their files were in disarray and they had nothing. Enduring questions remained after La Noche, Tris that have taken the Mexican government over 30 years to answer. Eventually in 2001, President Vicente Fox, the president who ended the 70-year reign of the PRI, attempted to resolve the question of who had orchestrated the massacre. 
President Fox ordered the release of previously classified documents concerning the 1968 massacre. The documents revealed that Elena Poniatowska's synthesis of the events that October night was accurate, as Kate Doyle uncovered. Thousands of students gathered in the square and, as you say, the government version is that the students opened fire. Well, there's been pretty clear evidence now that there was a unit that was called the Brigada Olympica, or the Olympic Brigade, that was made up of special forces of the Presidential Guard, who opened fire from the buildings that surrounded the square, and that that was the thing that provoked the massacre. President Fox also appointed Ignacio Carrillo Prieto in 2002 to prosecute those responsible for ordering the massacre. In 2006, former President Luis Echeverria was arrested on charges of genocide. However, in March 2009, after a convoluted appeal process, the genocide charges against Echeverria were dismissed. The Mexican newspaper The News reported that a tribunal of three circuit court judges ruled that there was not enough proof to link Echeverria to the violent suppression of hundreds of protesting students on October 2, 1968. Despite the ruling, prosecutor Carrillo Prieto said he would continue his investigation and seek charges against Echeverria before the United Nations International Court of Justice and the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, U.S. government records. In October 2003, the role of the United States government in the massacre was publicized when the National Security Archive at George Washington University published a series of records from the CIA, the Pentagon, the State Department, the FBI and the White House which were released in response to Freedom of Information Act requests. The documents detail that in response to Mexican government concerns over the security of the Olympic Games, the Pentagon sent military radios, weapons, ammunition and riot control training material to Mexico before and during the crisis. That the CIA station in Mexico City produced almost daily reports concerning developments within the university community and the Mexican government, from July to October. Six days before the massacre at Tlatelolco, both Echeverria and head of federal security Fernando Gutierrez Barrios told the CIA that the situation will be under complete control very shortly. That the Diaz Ordaz government arranged to have student leader Socrates Campos Limas accuse dissident pre politicians such as Carlos Madrazo of funding and orchestrating the student movement.